morning, everyone. Um, I'm Rob Atkins, the president of ICAF, and I want to welcome you to this event where we're releasing a new report this morning articulating uh, a, 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 what a national trade sector strategy should look like and what are some specific uh, policy ideas that would be entailed in that. At the same time, uh, we're also hearing from uh, a few colleagues uh, who, uh, and, and David Hart, who produced a report uh, for the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy on the Advanced Management Strategy. So we're going to be really two things. I'm going to introduce folks very quickly, uh, and then um, we'll you'll hear from Stephen and I on our report, and then I'll turn it over to David Hart to be uh, the presentation on the second report. Uh, first of all, I want to thank Stephen Azell. Stephen really was the lead author of our work report and has done no one's work on that. Uh, he's a senior analyst at ITIF dealing with competitiveness and uh, science and technology policy. Uh, David Hart, uh, to uh, Stephen's right, is an associate professor at George Mason University in the public policy program. David has a long, long background uh, as a scholar in looking at technology and innovation policy. Most recently, he was uh, as a fellow uh, in the uh, Office of Science and Technology Policy in the White House and has a recent book by MIT Press, Unlocking Energy Innovation. Roger Kilmer, to my immediate left, is the director of the NIST Manufacturing Extension Partnership. Should be no introduction. Uh, the MEP program is a national program that works with a network of centers around the country, modeled on, if you will, the Agricultural Extension Service to go and help our nation's small and mid-sized manufacturers become more competitive and more productive. And I'm going to leave uh, Teresa and uh, Martin for um, for David to introduce you when we get to that point. So let me start. Um, Why are we talking about this issue? Uh, back up and say, well, we, we intentionally named this report a trade sector strategy and not a manufacturing strategy because what we believe is that the United States is the core or the core nature of U.S. economic problems in the last decade and, and continuing through today really stem from one principal factor. And that is the inability of the U.S. to be fully competitive on global trade sectors. So when you think about this, it doesn't really matter whether Walmart or Safeway or Kroger or Giant uh, wins the grocery store market and puts the other firm out of business. So it's going to be the same number of grocery store jobs in America. It really does matter whether Boeing uh, wins in the aircraft market against, uh, against Airbus or whether Cisco wins in the rubber uh, business against Huawei. Uh, in other words, there's a set of firms in the United States that make up about a third of our economy that are competing intensely in global markets. And increasingly, we're not winning that race. And uh, those are mostly, uh, most of manufacturing is in that category, but certainly software, certainly advanced engineering services, and some other sectors. But manufacturing is the principal part of that. And you can see there, in the last decade, we lost about 33% of our manufacturing jobs. This is unprecedented in American history. This is the second fastest loss of manufacturing jobs in any country ever. Only Great Britain can beat us on that score. And it's a, uh, a factor that has happened all around the country, with the exception of Alaska, uh, where they uh, don't have very many manufacturing jobs. Uh, they added some. But you can see the losses were significant, and not just in the uh, quote unquote industrial uh, belt of the Midwest and Northeast, but the South, which historically has done well in manufacturing in the last three decades, except for now, and the West. So you can see across the board problems in U.S. manufacturing. Uh, we argue that those are principally related to a failure uh, to increase output, and when measured properly, U.S. manufacturing output actually fell by 11% last decade. Again, never, ever happened before in American history. Never had a decade where we're producing fewer manufacturing goods 
in inflation adjusted returns than we did at the beginning of the decade. So, one of the core principles. Uh, we would argue that if we're going to renew in for, uh, the U.S. economy and improve our trading sectors, we've got to um, do four things. One is we have to have a focus on trading sectors. Uh, secondly, uh, which is a little bit different than the way a lot of economists look at it. A lot of economists look at it as car rental, car production. What's the difference? It's all cars. Uh, and in fact, as I said before, if we don't have a healthy trading sector, we can't have a healthy U.S. economy. Secondly, we need to really go back and re-embrace and reinvigorate our engineering culture. The U.S. has the best science and entrepreneur-based uh, innovation system in the world, we would argue. That's our core strength. That's not enough anymore. Uh, a lot of our science discoveries now are taken by other countries, and they engineer those into high-value added products and create the jobs. You, know, you look at a country like Germany that uh, is really the epitome of an engineering culture. They embrace engineering, they produce a lot of engineers, the companies are engineering based. We need to really get back to that and embrace not just science, but engineering as well. Uh, thirdly, we need to have an economic system that's based much more on production rather than consumption. I won't go into the details, but if you want to, the new book that Stephen and I just released uh, through the Yale Press, the Innovation Economics, details how the U.S. economy really shifted away from investment towards consumption the result is longer term productivity and innovation has suffered. And lastly, we need to seriously rethink the global trading system. No matter what we do, no matter how good we are, we are still not going to be able to win if we're confronting a global trading system that is engaged in what we would call systemic mercantilist practices. So the fact that the Chinese uh, subsidize their currency, manipulate standards, force US companies to transfer technology, steal IP, et cetera, et cetera, and that other countries are modeling that as a serious problem. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Stephen and welcome to you. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Thanks, Rob. Good morning. So what do we need to do? Well, first, we need to throw our traded sector firms a life raft. And this report shows a way to do so by articulating 50 federal level policies and 13 state level policies organized around regulatory reform, a better ability to assess the competitiveness of the trade sectors of our economy, financial or uh, access to capital recommendations, and then our four T's of technology, tax, trade, and talent. And I will just hit uh, some of the highlights from each of these categories. First of all, with regard to regulatory reform, we need smarter regulations on all U.S. firms, but on trading sector firms in particular. So it's particularly important that when federal agencies introduce regulations to address public interest goals, such as environmental protection or worker safety, that they also take account of the impact that these regulations will have on the competitiveness of U.S. trading sectors. Therefore, we should require the Office of Man Management and Budget and its OIRA, its Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs, to incorporate a competitive screen into its review of any new federal recommendations. With regard to financing, we need to ensure that all traded sector firms, large and small alike, have access to the capital they need for research and development, for innovation, uh, to expand their product lines, and to enter new markets. The report presents five recommendations around finance uh, such as transforming Fannie Mae into an industrial bank, and also shifting the Small Business Administration's focus more toward traded sector firms. As Rob alluded to, uh, not all small firms are created alike, and SBA should be focused more on supporting high-growth, entrepreneurial, gazelle-type firms operating in traded sectors. And therefore, one thing Congress should do is both require the Small Business Administration to disclose the percentage of its uh, Section 7 VA uh, lending that goes to traded versus non-trade sector firms, and also to increase the percentage of its lending activity going to firms operating in traded sectors. With regard to technology, the report presents a total of eight recommendations that, if implemented, would help spur advanced manufacturing, restore America's industrial commons, upgrade the technological capability or capacity of American manufacturers, 
and boost the ability of SMEs, small and medium enterprise manufacturers, uh, to compete in global markets. One of the most important recommendations in the report is that the United States should create a nationwide uh, network of at least 25 manufacturing institutes, this is NNMI, the National Network for Manufacturing uh, Innovation. Uh, what these would be are institutes that would bring together industry, universities, community colleges, states, federal agencies to accelerate innovation by investing in industrial, industrially relevant advanced manufacturing technologies with broad applications. So these NNMIs would be technology or sector focused uh, and they would spur uh, advanced uh, translational or applied R&D and help uh, bring research closer to commercialization, closer to market. As Rob discussed, we should also bring our universities much more in line with industry. And one way to do that would be by supporting the designation of 20 US manufacturing universities. Uh, these manufacturing universities would revamp their engineering departments to get them much more engaged in manufacturing engineering and to work more closely with the problems that are faced by industry. We also need to increase funding for the Manufacturing Expansion <coughs> Partnership, which directly engages SME manufacturers to boost their productivity and their innovation ability. The MEP program is one of the most successful in the federal government. For every $1 of federal investment in MEP, it generates $30 of economic growth. Unfortunately, when you look at how the United States supports the MEP compared to how other nations like Japan, Canada, or Germany support their small manufacturers through these manufacturing extension agencies, uh, you find that Japan invests three times more as a share of GDP in its related program, the uh, Kosa Sutsu Centers, than the United States does in the MEP. Therefore, we should substantially increase funding for MEP, at least doubling its budget to $220 million annually. With regard to tax, the U.S. corporate tax code is becoming increasingly globally uncompetitive. One study found that U.S. multinational enterprises are among the world's highest tax. And, in fact, U.S. manufacturing firms are the world's third highest tax, paying an average corporate tax rate 37% higher than Asian manufacturers. So we need to lower the corporate tax rate. However, an approach solely focused on lowering the rate and broadening the base will not be sufficient. Any reform of the tax code must preserve and enhance key manufacturing tax incentives, such as the R&D tax credit, accelerated appreciation, and the domestic production deduction. When you look at the R&D tax credit, uh, of course the US invented this instrument in 1981, and as late as 1992 had the world's most generous R&D tax credit. But today, we're 27th in the world in R&D tax credit generosity with an R&D tax credit that is even less generous than that of Brazil, China, or India. So the report articulates that what we should do is implement a quasi-incremental innovation and investment tax credit that would allow enterprises to take a credit on investments in R&D, equipment and software, and workforce training for any expenditures that exceed 75% of the base level. With regard to trade, we know that U.S. traded sector enterprises can thrive when they compete on a level playing field in global markets. Unfortunately, the debt is increasingly stacked against them as they run up against discriminatory or unfair trade practices being implemented by what we call innovation working plus nations. Therefore, what we need to do is deploy a three-pronged national trade strategy focused on trade promotion, trade enforcement, and market opening, and also increase funding for U.S. trade policy making and enforcement agencies. It's critically important that we understand that success in trade is not completing new trade deals. It's completing new high standard trade deals with countries that are willing to embrace the concept of fair trade, uh, fair market-based trade across global markets. Finally, with regard to talent, the report articulates a total of eight talent policies that will ensure that traded sector enterprises have access to the skilled talent they need 
while also creating attractive employment opportunities for American workers. In particular, we need to increase the adoption of industry-recognized nationally portable credentials, such as those produced by the Manufacturing Skills Standards Council. Now, in the 2000s, we went off a different track where we had programs like WIRED that tried to promote regional skill standard certifications. But all this did was lead to a proliferation of regional skill sets that weren't nationally portable, so it wasn't always clear to workers uh, that they had a, a credential that they could transfer on a nationwide basis. Manufacturers didn't know what skills employees coming to them really had. So we need federal funding uh, that would support uh, the creation of these types of national portable standards. And finally, we need to expand manufacturing, vocational, and education programs at community colleges, such as the uh, Community to Careers Pathway that has been advocated by the Obama administration. So that's just a sampling of the 50 federal level policy recommendations in the report. I encourage you to read them all. And now I will turn it back to Rob for closing remarks. So I guess just to close, when you look at other countries around the world, what you see is fairly articulated uh, policy strategies and implementation, very strong bipartisan support. Uh, in other countries, they argue about a lot of the same hot button issues we argue about, but they don't argue about this issue. They generally see that if their countries can't compete, uh, we're going to lose. And in a way, it's because other countries think of themselves the way state governments think of themselves. So I used to work for a governor in a state, and, and we had the, uh, the view that um, we couldn't have any kind of corporate tax code we wanted. We couldn't have any kind of education system we wanted. We couldn't have any kind of regulatory climate. We were in competition with other states and other countries. And if we didn't essentially do everything we could to make our state the most attractive state in the country, or one of them, we would continue to lose. And it's really only the US, I mean, I hate to say this, it really is only the US that has this view that somehow we don't, we're not in that thing, that somehow we have enough size and legacy uh, tradition that we can avoid having to really compete in global marketplaces. And you hear this from both the right and the left. Uh, people like Paul Krugman on the left and Greg Mankiw on the right, both have been quoted in the last year saying, the US simply does not compete with other countries. Our firms may compete with other firms who may or may not be located in other countries, but as a country, we don't compete. And I think that's really, in a lot of ways, the most, the most serious challenge to us moving forward is getting rid of that really antiquated 20th century notion that we're so dominant, we're so big, we're so good that we're above competition. The reality is we're not anymore. And unless we put in place, in our, our view, that a trade and sector strategy that has some of these components, uh, the economy will continue to suffer on the one with suboptimal job growth, suboptimal income growth, and suboptimal GDP growth. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, David Hart. Great, thanks, Rob. Um, we have a, another slide there. So while that's going up, um, uh, I just want to uh, introduce and, and thank the next presenter. So I had the privilege last year of serving at the White House Office of Science and Technology and Policy, where I had the title of Assistant Director for Innovation Policy, um, and I returned to academia this fall. In that role, I was closely involved in the uh, Advanced Manufacturing Partnership, and particularly uh, the development of the Advanced Manufacturing Partnership's Steering Committee report, which you'll hear about next. Uh, the Steering Committee was made up of 12 uh, CEOs of major manufacturing companies and six uh, university presidents, and they were led by Susan Hockfield, who was at that time the president of MIT, and Andrew Liveris, uh, chairman and CEO of Dow Chemical Corporation. And this group operated within the PCAS framework, that is, they were uh, a formal advisory committee. Um, and in that role, they firmly grasped uh, the pen. This was not a White House report that is uh, uh, has the uh, label of these uh, advisors, but um, they did the work and uh, we really benefited from, from their ideas. Uh, and a lot of volunteer time and energy went into the report, and uh, nobody put more time and energy into it than uh, Marty and Teresa. So um, it 
it's no, ex no exaggeration to say that without their effort, this report wouldn't, uh, wouldn't exist. And they have day jobs. Um, so uh, uh, I don't speak for the White House anymore, but uh, individually, um, and I'm sure my colleagues over there will join me um, in saying a huge thank you to them for, uh, for their efforts. Um, so Teresa uh, is the Vice President for Sustainable Technologies and Innovation Sourcing uh, at Dow. Uh, and Marty is the Associate Provost, and um, before that, or maybe he was still a Professor of Electrical Engineering, or he was graduated in the administration uh, at MIT. Um, so uh, they're going to share with you the findings of this uh, report um, that they were so instrumental in, in drafting, and uh, then we'll um, provide some comments that I hope tie, tie together both. Thanks, David. And I want to I want to thank David because, uh, as neophytes to this process of engaging the government in this capacity. I think Teresa and I benefited tremendously from David's uh, stewardship of the process. Um, so we're happy to be here. Thank you for coming. Uh, what we're going to do, uh, Teresa and I have this choreographed activity where I'll do some introductory remarks. Teresa will dive into some of the specific recommendations around innovation. I'll talk to you about some of the recommendations we have around workforce development, and then uh, and then Teresa will close it out by talking about some of the policy issues and and, and some framing uh, closing remarks. Um, I have to say that uh, basically I'm a geek. Uh, I've been a professor at MIT my entire adult life. Uh, I've had the benefit of uh, of engaging in a lot of research and spinning out technologies into companies. And so entering into this discussion, it's that context. And I, I will say that the recommendations that we're making here are ones that for somebody who has started companies, who's transferred technologies to companies, and who works in an educational environment, these recommendations make an awful lot of sense to us in terms of what is necessary to uh, support domestic manufacturing. So it's something that I think both Teresa and I feel very passionate about. Uh, now, when we get into things like policy and whatnot, and if you ask me a question about trade, you know, honestly, if, if we're talking about the trade between the Dodgers and the Red Sox, I have uh, deep knowledge and great passion and can speak quite authoritatively about that. Other types of trade, maybe not so much. Um, our work started here. Uh, in the summer of uh, 2011, the President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology issued this report. Uh, and uh, they opined in that report that there were three reasons why one should worry about domestic manufacturing. Jobs, the linkage of, the important linkage of innovation and manufacturing, and national security. And so our activities are built on this premise. We, we're, we're sort of fast forwarding to a set of actionable recommendations that we think um, will help strengthen domestic manufacturing for those reasons. Uh, the uh, PCAS offered, also in the report, offered this uh, definition of advanced manufacturing. You often ask, well, what do you mean by advanced manufacturing? And actually, this is a, it's a pretty good uh, um, definition. I won't bother to read it to you in detail, but I want to kind of point out a couple of things. The, the definition explicitly identifies that advanced manufacturing can involve both conventional and novel products. So I work in the nanotechnology space. I've been involved in commercialized, developing and commercializing products that use very advanced nanotechnology fabrication capabilities. But I can tell you, and then in, in the formation of electronics and things like that, I can tell you that, you know, a few miles from my office in South Boston, what would seem to be a fairly pedestrian uh, device, namely the razor that I used to shave this morning, is in fact an advanced manufacturing product. That Gillette razor uses diamond-like carbon coatings, uses high-speed laser welding and backing material, precision injection molding, and custom-formulated polymers to form the springs that suspend the razors. And so the notion is that advanced manufacturing can be embedded in a lot of the conventional products that we wouldn't necessarily think of as being embodying advanced manufacturing. Um, our mission statement and output is here basically what we were tasked to do was identify collaborative opportunities, working industry, academia, government, and, and some specific outcomes, which we'll talk about as we get through this. Uh, as uh, David mentioned, this was the team that uh, was assembled to uh, run the AMP process. Uh, Twelve industry members represented here, uh, six research universities with a, a strong manufacturing legacy, 
and, and a number of government agency participants. And it was a very interactive process. So we did have day jobs, but this was a, a blast. And, and so the extra 20 hours a week on this was, was, uh, was actually a lot of fun. Um, and, uh, and everybody put their, uh, put their uh, uh, shoulder to the wheel in, in getting this work done. So there's not you know, tremendous participation. Um, the work was sort of divided into a set of work streams focusing on technology development. So what are the things we can do to develop technologies that support and enhance domestic manufacturing and bring those technologies to the manufacturing floor? Shared infrastructure and facilities. What investments can we make in infrastructure that benefits entire manufacturing sectors? Uh, education and workforce development. We'll talk about that, but what can be done to strengthen uh, the workforce that works in advanced manufacturing? policy and then a, a group focused on outreach, making sure that as we did this process, we were engaged with lots of folks. Um, one of the things that we did early on was identify the importance of having regional meetings to really um, sort of crowdsource uh, what some of the issues were, as well as start uh, testing ideas that were emerging from our discussions. Four regional meetings were held across the United States, Atlanta, Cambridge, Massachusetts, Michigan, and uh, California, uh, we had over 1,200 attendees, um, and I would call it a coalition of the willing. Uh, a lot of people very passionate about this subject, pretty uniformly distributed both in terms of participation in each of the meetings, but also the demographics very broad. Local government officials, universities, community college representatives, small and medium manufacturers and large manufacturers, all came to these meetings, all engaged. Um, uh, we did a lot of outreach through surveys, uh, interviewing lots of various organizations and a lot of targeted outreach. And the one thing I want to say while this slide is up is that what is astonishing <coughs> to me upon reflection is that this enormously strong consensus that emerged from these 1,200 people and the various other folks that we uh, that uh, we polled through our process, namely that the recommendations that are in the AMP report were very consistent with all of the things we heard and all the recommendations we were getting from this group. There was not a lot of divergence in whether or not these recommendations were the recommendations that were important. Um, so what are the recommendations? Well, there, there's a number of them, and we're going to talk through some of them. Uh, but what we did in organizing the report was to recognize that basically the recommendations sort of fall into three categories. There's a set of recommendations focused on enabling innovation, which we'll start with and Teresa will present. There's a set of recommendations on what we refer to as securing the talent pipeline, and finally a set of recommendations on things to improve the business climate for manufacturers. So at this point, I'd like to turn the floor over to Teresa. Great, thank you, Marty. I miss our tag team events. <laughs> the first piece um, on improving innovation really emanated with our task of calling out a permanent mechanism for us, not only to have this group of industry and academic and um, um, the, the public private sector, but how do we move forward and really defining a permanent mechanism of priorities? And so those really fall out into four categories. A call for creation of a national strategy and objectives. And that would be used to prioritize a list of critical strategic needs and required technologies. From that identification and prioritization, technology roadmaps would be generated. From those, the call out of which specific programs would be established and executed. And then a recognition that as those programs move forward, a process by which we would need to go through program review. Now what is the framework for identifying, prioritizing, and developing uh, these manufacturing technologies? Recognition number one is we need to start with national strategic needs. From a national strategic needs basis, what's really required from defense security, energy security, food security, health security, homeland security, economic security as a framework of context? We're already making investments as a nation in these regards. What are they and where are we having gaps? Also, a context around global market demand. Where are there opportunities, getting back to the trade and trade balance discussion, for which the US can establish itself to be a global market leader and exporter? 
a reality around U.S. industrial competitiveness today, as well as technology readiness. So this was a framework that we proposed would be used. And not to belabor the eye chart, but the eye chart's really here in the context of our testing through some of the concepts. If we were to come through with a technology domain, how important is it? Is it of high U.S. national security needs, high global market demand? Is U.S. industrial maturity or competitiveness no, low global technology level? And that really drives what are the implications of that and what role would need to be played by industry, academia, and government moving forward. The framework, in essence, set the context for uh, the, the recommendation of, one, establishing a five-year framed national advanced manufacturing strategic plan and that we fundamentally utilize it then to drive the technology programs and public-private investments. Um, we also called out in the AMP process, who do we see accountable, if we're going to convert these ideas to action, in, in enabling this. Um, in the course of the, the AMP um, team being in place, the Advanced Manufacturing National Program Office was formed and we called out their role in working with interagencies to coordinate and align interagency programs and then putting in place a joint industry, university, government uh, partnership to review. So what would be those initial cross-cutting technologies? And this is a piece of Marty's comment on consensus. We ran surveys amongst the industry members, and as you may have reflected on that list, highly diverse in both industry segments covered, all generally multinationals, but some were not, and covering everything from healthcare to aerospace to chemical advanced materials sector, um, consumer products. We had gone and surveyed that group. Where in what domains? Do you, as an entity, intend to invest in the U.S. in the, ten year, in the next 10 years? What do you see are the critical technology gaps that are inhibiting or, uh, today and or would enable acceleration for future uh, investment in the U.S.? And then that formed the context of our initial feedback. We then went out working with NAM and others uh, to, with small and medium enterprises, as well as regional meetings to identify a set of cross-cutting technologies. And this is the net result of that list of cross-cutting technologies. Additive manufacturing, advanced forming and joining technologies, advanced materials design, synthesis and processing, advanced sensing, measuring and process control, visualization, informatics, digital manufacturing technologies, and the coupling between these last two in the smart meeting manufacturing sector, sustainable manufacturing, effective use and reuse of materials, particularly undercurrent across all of these and effective energy utilization processes, nanomanufacturing, flexible electronics, biomanufacturing, bioinformatics, advanced manufacturing testing equipment, and industrial robotics were the primary things that emerged. Another aspect that was addressed were how do we, in fact, bring the right public-private partnerships together to accelerate the development in these areas? Recognizing that, yes, we have great science, we have great invention, but there is a chasm between the conversion of those ideas to viable competitive products. And then, how do we actually bring the know-how to, to and skills required? That really is the framework that emerged the concept of the National Manufacturing Innovation Institutes and establishment of a network of manufacturing innovation institutes. A recognition that this is really a partnership at federal, state, regional level with industry, university, and community colleges. And the concept would be to identify a manufacturing innovation institute that brings both expertise of industry with very strong matching dollars from day one, not in a, in a period extended out, but from day one, along with university and along with community colleges, to design the Manufacturing Innovation Institutes to be a hands-on learning and very project-based. So both training and development and conversion of technology. Um, as you may be aware, a pilot of the Manufacturing Innovation Institute, where there was a call right after the, the release of the Advanced Manufacturing Report, 
a very rapidly uh, response and actually an award for additive manufacturing initial innovation institute in that particular case there were more than uh, 16 i believe proposals that came 12 12 excuse me 12 that came forward over 400 million in matching dollars from the industrial members and this was executed in a period of, of eight weeks from call to award. So the reality is, if it's in a space that industry cares about, the ability to bring joint teams of industry, small, medium, and large, bring university and community college with very robust proposals is incredibly strong. Um, in this particular case, it's a 40 million match with partners, 30 million of federal, and a number of companies, universities, community colleges that are called out. There are a number of other recommendations in the enabling innovation, uh, but we, in the spirit of time, won't go through those in detail. Uh, one specifically around improving the environment for industry university partnerships and addressing some of the uh, tax specific barriers in terms of uh, private investments in universities. Some very specific actions that can be taken very quickly. And then policies in terms of enhancing university and industry engagement for um, uh, support of accelerating the entrepreneurship and spin out of, of uh, technologies from the university environment. The last piece pertains to the creation of what we call the National Manufacturing Portal. And largely in the spirit, there's a lot going on both in public and private sector, and having a web based resource that could be actively utilized across the nation to tap in and uncover those um, capabilities that exist in the United uh, various groups. Now I'll say why to Marty for the security challenge. Thanks, Lisa. Uh, this, uh, this was a very vibrant area for the, uh, for the work stream that participated in this, in part because you had university folks who obviously have a lot of interest in education, but, but the industry participants have a lot of experience in, in these issues as well. Um, the first recommendation has to do with the image of manufacturing. It, it's absolutely astonishing across the board from all the outreach we did, people's frustration with a, a sort of general lack of understanding of what, all, what the career opportunities are in advanced manufacturing and what really advanced manufacturing is about. The idea that manufacturing is dark, dirty, and dangerous is just outdated. Uh, modern factories today don't look like that. And the career opportunities in manufacturing today are phenomenal. And that message needs to get out, and we need to think deeply about how to do that. And I'm happy to say that a lot of things are happening in that space, but more can. Um, uh, tapping the talent pool of returning veterans. You know, I ran a lab at MIT, and I can tell you some of the best people I had were retirees of the nuclear Navy, as far as electromechanical folks that fix things. Uh, and, and getting those, these folks schooled up to contribute in the manufacturing sector. The work stream looked carefully at all the activities that are going on in terms of transitioning veterans, and specifically identified the TAP program as an opportunity to really help transition veterans into the manufacturing sector. Uh, investing in community college level. Uh, I have to say that what was interesting about this is that here you have six advanced research universities so when you would naturally think, well, if you want to invest in manufacturing, you send it to my campus. Collectively, with the industry, everyone recognized, boy, there's a real sweet spot for opportunity in the community college level of education. These are the, this is where the training happens for the workforce. And, and, and this is the opportunity to address the skills gap that we heard consistently throughout all of our outreach. Folks are petrified with the fact that they have a brain workforce that's operating very sophisticated manufacturing tools in their factories, and they don't see the people that they can hire to replace them. And those people are going to get trained at the community college level. Now, having said that, we can't just pull down a box that says community college on it, open the lid and shake dollars into it and expect that to work. There's some real opportunities to innovate in the way in which education is delivered at the community college level to specifically address the sector. Um, we already heard um, in Stephen's remarks about credentialing. AMP uh, absolutely endorses the notion of stackable credentials and, and helping uh, get uh, that part of the training process working. Uh, we saw a lot of opportunities to improve what we do at the universities to support manufacturing, and then also identify the opportunity to think about fellowships and internships uh, at national level to, uh, to highlight the opportunities of manufacturing. 
The last piece was on improving business climate. First, on tax reform, echoing a number of Stevens and the ITIF uh, report recommendations. First and foremost, strengthen and make permanent the R&D tax credits. The uncertainty of it not being permanent and the ability to drive and influence um, the incentives for R&D investment in the U.S. Second on this is, of course, lowering corporate tax rate to bring it in line with the other uh, advanced economies and also create internationally competitive corporate tax. The second piece is on smarter regulations. Smarter regulations are absolutely paramount. And by that we mean early engagement and better cost benefit analysis using sound science and international best practices. Too much redundancy and in not, it's adding cost and time and being able to move as quickly and compete on a global basis. On trade policy, the focus on the AMP report was really focused on non-tariff barriers and export control standardization. To really look at the opportunity to be able to facilitate and engage on a global basis in a competitive way. And the fourth piece, an undercurrent through all of the discussions, was the credit criticality in the U.S. of us having sound energy policy. And quite frankly, with the more energy intensive um, industry sectors, the role that this is playing at the most senior level of the company, from CEO level and strategy. And so undercurrent of focus on energy efficiency and conservation, identification of options to increase and diversify domestic supplies, the speed and development of cost competitive renewable sources in that context, and the continual transition to look at opportunities that will position the U.S. to be competitive on a long-term basis. So net net. Uh, the, the 16 recommendations that came from the AMP report, we've highlighted a number of those. The report goes into much greater detail, and then furthermore, there are appendices associated with each of these sections that were done by the work streams that have significant background and feedback from the outreach and engagement. Overall, what's our objective and what's our key message? The AMP recommendations really are intended to design a reinvention of manufacturing it's a very heavy focus on the future, the foundation of developing and putting in place policy that provides a level playing field, the focus on the development of the work, future workforce that's required, as well as bringing forward and accelerating the conversion of the technologies um, to enable the U.S. to be world leading in this regard. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Teresa. Uh, Roger? Um, Thanks, Rob. Uh, so I, I didn't ask, do you want me to treat all 66 recommendations one at a time? Well, first of all, there's only 50. Uh, well, uh, well, I was actually. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah 60. Well, right. well, some are overlapping. So, so uh, no, in all seriousness, let me, uh, I, I actually point that out for, for a good reason. That is, uh, when you're looking at manufacturing, uh, We've seen from the list of recommendations here, it's, it's very diverse, very complicated uh, system. And the problem, as I see it, is there's not a system. There's not the things that connect these different elements together with the manufacturer in mind at the end. Uh, we individually look at each of these areas and we try to optimize that area, but not necessarily in the context of the system. I'm an engineer by training, so I like to think this way. Um, I'm not a policy person, uh, but let me let me give you a little bit of the context of, of why I say some of these things based on our experience with the MEP program. So as Rob mentioned, I've got a network of centers and field offices in all 50 states around the country. Uh, we go out and work hands-on uh, with primarily small and medium-sized manufacturers. What we end up being mostly is a connector, helping the manufacturer understand what's out there, what's available, help them assess their situation, help them identify opportunities, and then connect them with the right resources. And so, what does that mean? That means that if it's innovation and technology, I've got to connect it with the research organizations, folks that can help me commercialize, 
I've got to connect them with the finance folks that can help pay for that. I've got to connect them with the training folks that can either uh, train their existing staff or locate new staff to be able to operate those things. So you can't treat just one of those elements by itself. It really does involve all of those. The other general point I'd like to make is that in dealing with the small and medium-sized manufacturers, let's understand that this is the majority of establishments in the country. This is 98% of the establishments in the country. And they're very, very different than the large companies. They're critical to the large companies because they're part of that supply chain. But what they can handle, what they can do, what they know, what they can pay for is very different than the perception that I think the general public has of, of what large companies and what manufacturers are. So as you address these different recommendations and different policies, they all apply, but they all apply in different ways and at different levels, depending upon what size manufacturer you are, what industry you're in, uh, but they all do come into play. So, so let me address just a, a couple of the, the cross-cutting things that I think that are there. And one certainly is innovation, and it's something that, that we are very much, much focused on. If we're going to be competitive, if we're going to actually move uh, manufacturing to this advanced manufacturing state, we really need to get have companies and help them innovate. And technology is really a key driver to that. So how we connect them into uh, the technology sources, how they can implement that into their processes or their products, I think are a, a key, key part of that. Uh, and important uh, if we're going to move through the needle on manufacturing. The other part, uh, other thing I'll, I'll mention is, is the workforce. And certainly right now, as I talk to uh, my center folks and their partners around the country, it's, it's the skilled workforce. It's, it's uniformly the issue regardless of what type of it, manufacturing industry you're in. And so we keep talking of, uh, about STEM, we keep talking about some community college things, we keep talking about that. And I'll take it on us is that manufacturers own some of this issue too. But we do not, manufacturers do not look at their workforce and treat it in a strategic fashion like they do the rest of their business. And so one of the focuses we've got from the MVP program is to work with the small and medium sized manufacturer and say, hey, this is one of your key assets. You need to treat it that way. And so things like the credentialing, et cetera, all feed into that uh, in, in terms of you've got to have the right workforce, not just today, but for the next year or the next five years. And how do you think and prepare for those sort of things? So again, be strategic about that. And, and again, it's it's a system. So there's a system, there's systems within systems. So if you want to look at the workforce piece, there are lots of organizations. You've got to make the connections between the end user, if that's the manufacturer, and everybody along that chain. Uh, the last thing, uh, I'm going to actually keep my time. Um, uh, that was mentioned, and this is a little bit of a plug, but certainly the perception is of what manufacturing is and how what it looks like, how important it is, uh, is something that, that I have to deal with every day. Uh, there's perceptions that I deal with across agencies, uh, within uh, Congress, within the states. And I haven't mentioned much about the states, but there are another key player in this. Uh, and so, kind of a grassroots thing that's gaining momentum, and I uh, believe it's going to continue on beyond this year, but on October 5th, uh, we've teamed with uh, FMA, which is the Fabricators and Manufacturers Association, uh, with NAM and with the Manufacturing Institute of NAM, to promote what they're calling Manufacturing Day, which is really getting a manufacturer to host an event to bring in the public, bring in the local uh, politicals, uh, bring in other folks uh, that are in the, in the region, to really show them what manufacturing is. Uh, and if you go on to, I think it's manufacturingday.com is the website, you can get a little sense of where it is and where the events are. I think they're up to 130 uh, different uh, manufacturers uh, have volunteered to open their doors to help that process. Again, this was something that started just weeks ago, maybe slightly, maybe a couple months. Uh, but something that I think is important in terms of kind of changing the whole perception uh, that affects uh, not only uh, kind of the general public view, but also helping to, to feed that pipeline for the skilled workforce that they manufacturing is really a, a, a viable alternative for those folks. 
So with that, I can stop. Great. Thank you, Roger. David? So I get to put on my academic uh, hat now and just highlight a few themes from these two reports. Uh, before I do, I want to just um, acknowledge the hard work of Rob and Steve and ITIF as well. Um, I've had a long affiliation with them, and um, I can say that um, they have a unique uh, spot in uh, the Washington um, um, policymaking scene, and, uh, especially in this area, they have a, a tremendous uh, role. Um, so, uh, just bringing together three themes, and then I'll comment on the <coughs> policy areas. Uh, the first point I want to make is that the advanced manufacturing sector, and more broadly as the ITIF reports uh, puts it, the broader traded sector, it is a worthy focus for federal policy. Uh, Gene Sperling likes to say that these industries punch above their weight in terms of economic uh, activity. They have a large multiplier effect. Um, they're vital for our trade and to address the global imbalances that have contributed to uh, the economic downturn in recent years. Um, and they contribute disproportionately to innovation and productivity. So that's the first thing. This is something that we ought to have a policy about. Uh, the second is that the U.S. can and should do better in this area. We're not going to get every manufacturing job, um, and uh, we shouldn't try to get every manufacturing job in the world. There's a global division of labor for good reasons. Um, there are low-skill, uh, low-wage manufacturing jobs that um, should uh, move elsewhere. Um, but other countries, especially Germany, show that it's possible to compete in these sectors uh, while maintaining high wages, while maintaining strong environmental and labor standards. Um, and as some of the new paradigms uh, emerge that uh, Theresa in particular was talking about, there's an opportunity for the U.S. to get back into this uh, game. To do that, and this is my third point, the U.S. needs to have what um, the ITIF report calls smart public-private partnerships. A lot of different kinds of partnerships. Uh, at different levels, uh, community, state, uh, especially regional, I would say, and the national, um, across a lot of different uh, industries, which are going to be different in different places, depending on the strengths of those places. And then finally, across a range of policy issues. So we, we pick your favorite uh, metaphor, whether it's the raft or the three buckets of the uh, AMP report. Um, there have to be a lot of different kinds of partnerships. Those sectors have to work together. And this has been a major theme of the administration's policy. But it's also a major theme of policy of governors, again, as Rob uh, alluded to. And this is true of uh, governors from both uh, parties. Uh, and the states, as Roger mentioned, do have an absolutely crucial role to play. Um, so in addition to these horizontal partnerships at local and regional levels among private sector, the public sector, the academic sector, community colleges, unions, lots of stakeholders, uh, there also has to be a partnership between the federal government and the states in this area, and NEP is uh, in the vanguard in that. So that's a theme that I think is really important to bring out. Then let me turn briefly just to a couple of policy issues, one on the innovation side and the other on talent, both of which have been discussed uh, a little bit, but I want to uh, drive home these points. So on the innovation side, I'm a big fan of the Manufacturing Innovation Institute concept, uh, which both reports endorse large-scale public-private uh, efforts that are oriented primarily to regional manufacturing needs um, that would have uh, federal involvement but also state involvement and be led by industry and include, as Teresa said, uh, skin in the game from the start. So both reports uh, converge on this concept and I think it's an important one and I hope that um, it's something that gets some traction up, up here on the hill. Um, I would say in this regard it's important for these institutes and for policies associated with them to take a broad view of innovation. Uh, while they're going to be focused on specific areas like additive manufacturing, um, it's important that these institutes aren't just about R&D or about technology transfer, uh, but about helping industry solve problems, supporting that problem solving with shared infrastructure, um, helping to train technicians as well as uh, graduate students. Uh, so we need a broad concept of innovation uh, uh, in these institutes. Um, because I think that will not only make them effective on the ground, but also make them sustainable over time. Uh, so it's not an R&D program per se, but it's an R&D program that's linked to an innovation system. Um, and NEP, I think, has a, a central role to play as well as a partner in these uh, efforts. So that's on the innovation side. In terms of talent, both reports stress uh, the importance of nationally recognizing, uh, nationally portable industry recognized credentials, um, especially at the technician level. So these are uh, uh, 
jobs that have uh, less than a, a bachelor's degree but more than a high school uh, education requirement. Um, this is where the skill gap that we heard a lot about from industry is concentrated. Um, so these kind of credentials have a number of virtues. First, they give employers confidence that workers know how to do the job. Uh, plain vanilla diploma is not enough anymore. It's important um, for, for employers to know that, um, that people can do the job. And on the worker side uh, as well, um, if they're going to be investing in training, increasingly workers are called upon to make investments and companies are, uh, are sharing or, um, or, or getting out of that game, they need to know that that investment is going to pay off. So these kinds of credentials give workers confidence. Um, and then the, the industry recognition, the updating uh, uh, process to make sure that those um, credentials keep up with the skills that are demanded by uh, employers, that provides guidance to my sector, the higher education sector, including community colleges in particular. Now, a lot of pieces of the system are in place. What's needed is to kind of congeal it and expand its adoption and fusion across the country. Um, so there's a lot of other things in the report. It's not enough just to have technology and talent. We need the rest of the raft or the other buckets. Um, we're going to need a sustained and broad-based effort. And there's a lot of ideas in the report. We didn't have time to do all 66, but hopefully you all can do that as your weekend uh, reading uh, this weekend. Um, but I did want to close with a quote from the ITF report, uh, which I, I strongly um, feel. Uh, as they say, the reality is that the U.S. cannot afford not to invest in programs that spur innovation and productivity. Right? It's, it's not a cost. Uh, it's an investment. Let me leave it there, and then I look forward to the discussion. Great. Well, thank you, uh, Roger and David, for those comments. Um, I want to open it up for comments or questions from you all. Uh, but before I do that, it strikes me one of the things I've observed over the past couple of decades in this is that people's orientation to economic policy is related somewhat to where they live. Um, so if you live in Detroit, you get manufacturing, you live in Boston, Silicon Valley, you can kind of get science-based innovation. Uh, and I think if you live in Washington, you, you don't get any of that. Um, from living here, uh, I was looking at some data today uh, for a new report we're doing um, that looks at the relationship between uh, state employment and state per capita income in manufacturing. Uh, and two interesting things there. One is it turns out that uh, between 2000 and 2010, there was a very, very strong correlation between change in manufacturing employment and change in overall employment. A point six correlation for those of you Remember your introductory statistics of positive 0.6 is a very strong correlation. And a, essentially a 0.5 correlation with income. So if you wanted to have more jobs in your state or more or, or higher incomes, it turns out that the health of the manufacturing sector mattered. So I looked at the spreadsheet this morning. It's what I do most every morning when I before I wake up, before I actually before I wake up and <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, <laughs> why we produce so much. And uh, so I'm looking at it, and California has got like, you know, 1.3 million manufacturing jobs, and North Carolina, I don't know, 600,000. And I get to Washington, D.C., and I see 176, and I'm thinking, oh, it must be 176,000. No, 176. Uh, I think that's part of the problem. I think we need to reindustrialize the district, and that will be a really, really good. Put some steel mills over here by, uh, over by uh, the house office building. So anyway, with that, let's open up the questions and more comments. If you can raise your hand, identify yourself. Ken, Max Cross, Maycon. How do people get paid? I mean, what's the price system? Or who owns the patents? And how is the technology transfer in terms of who pays for what? Yeah, well, I'm just going to add, I've known a lot of other folks do that. Uh, they've certainly worked that out in Germany. That system in Germany called the Fraunhofer Institute. It's been around since the late the early 50s, industry two-thirds of the money. Um, so there's certainly models of that. We actually have a couple of models already in the U.S. for all of those IT issues that work out. But uh, Teresa, do you want to jump into that? Oh, I'm presuming that relative to the Manufacturing Innovation Institute, your question, right? Um, so we had actually a very healthy dialogue around the design of what the IP um, uh, terms would be for the members both in terms of where there was shared technology that was getting the federal state funds, then the member organizations having access to that on a non-exclusive basis, 
and then also like Fraunhofer, opportunities for the industry members to actually directly fund research and programs and then with that, the specific IP terms. But again, we're with the formation of this pilot and we'll be moving forward. It's part of the drive to really ensure there are multiple industry members and as you can see in the additive manufacturing, there's 40 industry members that are participating, some much larger than others in terms of their contribution. I think another critical piece of this, unlike other institutes that have been formed, they, we really pushed hard, and David and uh, Marty know, pretty healthy debate in our team discussions on we do not need to do this as a pure grassroots built on everything from the ground. There's huge investment within our industry sector that can and should be being effectively utilized and complemented with the infusion of the investment both for the hands-on learning. I would speak on behalf of our own company. Our partnerships with the community colleges in which we're living, the Delta College in Michigan, the Brazosport College in Freeport, Texas, and Louisiana, of setting up hands-on learning, joint institutes, and curriculum development. It's very paramount for the new manufacturing facilities that we're going in to get the certified workers. So also the recognition teams of, boy, wouldn't it be terrific to also have our engineers that are going through bachelor's and master's also engaged in the hands-on learning and understanding how all of these pieces come together. So I think it's a different dimension for this particular one, and because of the co-investment of both physical assets of people and knowledge, along with a complementary um, support for the academic and community college that can be leverageable, it's a unique model. I don't understand how is it priced? How is the technology priced to the members, the people are using it? So, the, for each of the, um, the proposals, the industry members are actually making investment from day one. So, they're committing an annual investment of either dollars to support the research or providing in kind <coughs> resources, you know, physical assets, testing equipment. And then on the government side, the, the federal programs, I'm not intimate with the final details of the current additive manufacturing one, but in the federal programs are supporting the university um, academic activities. So if everyone has access to the technology developed? Yes. So as an example, there's a program in Ohio, in Columbus, which really fantastic program we set up by the state of Ohio back in the 80s as an economic development institute called, used to be called the Edison Welding Institute, now it's called EWI. And um, EWI to me is like a mini, a mini um, and an MI. Uh, it, it has a program there where you can, it basically works on advanced cutting and, and joining technologies. Um, it's pretty interesting, but actually when you walk into their lobby, they have this thing that kind of looks like a, a big kind of metal container and, and it just all caved in and looks like really, really terrible. And, and I asked the president, what is that? Said, well, we've been testing this thing for the military, for the army, because one of the problems in the army is they, they've strengthened their, um, their vehicles against uh, unexploded uh, I mean, IEDs, uh, uh, roadside -like bombs, and, and it turns out that the bomb, uh, when the metal is only 50,000 pounds per square inch, the bomb can go through the metal and, and obviously hurt or kill our, our, our soldiers. So they, what they've done is they put extra metal on there to 100,000 pounds, which works great, except that the wells break at 50,000. So now you just have this metal going on. And so what they did is they basically invented a new kind of well that's 100,000 pounds per square inch well, and that's the thing that they blew up this thing at 100,000 pounds to show that the wells didn't break. Um, anyway, the way, the, the way they deal with that is that they, they do some proprietary research that companies will fund, and then they do more generic research that tends to be funded by the government, mostly through uh, Mantech, uh, which is the DOD technology program. And there, they, their members can get, uh, basically, it's, uh, non their members can get access to essentially that shared technology. And there's some that's more specific, and then there's some that's more shared. And that's generally the way these things work. Uh, yeah, I, I don't have any doubt that these systems would work because we already have examples like that. We have a thing called the North Carolina Technology Transfer, the North Carolina Textile Technology 
center in, in a problem. And that's been working for years with textile companies. And, you, know, you wouldn't think there's advanced stuff on textile, but actually there's a lot of advanced technology now on textile, smart technology, smart textiles, and all sorts of things. So uh, I think those models are well proven. Um, other questions? Go here and then. Thank you, Mr. Congressman. You talked about how the site level is, and I'm wondering, shouldn't a lot of this be on the same concept? That is, where really is the federal book, apart from a few specific examples, say, is national security? Yeah, well, I, yeah, let me, let me actually, and I'll, I'll start because I, I thought very, very long and hard about that question, having worked for a governor a lot running economic policy. And states have a critical role in economic development, but there's two limitations. One, states don't do uh, sector-based national efforts. They do local efforts. So they might have their own, um, might have their own center for uh, uh, you know, optics in New York, but that's for New York firms. They don't do national sector-based things. And many of the challenges we face, I mean, if you look at the one of the big gaps in our innovation system is sector-based innovation efforts. Other countries do that, we don't, because states just simply aren't going to do it. You know, New York doesn't care about California firms, and Michigan doesn't care about Alabama firms. So you have to have that sector-based thing. And the second problem with states is, uh, as good as states are, they really don't fund this stuff very, very well. At best, if you add up all of their science and technology efforts, including in manufacturing, entrepreneurship, you name it, at best you're talking $2 billion. Now you look at what other countries are investing in this, and they're investing three, four, five times more. So I do think that states have to be a critical partner uh, in this. Any federal program should make sure that they enlist states as partners, but I just don't think we can rely on states. I don't think they have the heft nor the orientation to be able to do all what we need to do. And, and there are also are some critical issues that states simply can't address. I mean, we need a high school integration policy for the United States that has to get addressed at a federal level. So do uh, tax policies and you know, aligning tax credit. Uh, so do other things uh, such as trade, obviously, in terms of opening up uh, global markets to U.S. enterprises and enforcing their, our, our, their trade rights. So the federal government has to be part of this. Yeah, I was just going to say, I think uh, we, we, uh, we were, what, how many did you list? 11 or 12 proposals? So Massachusetts was one of the unsuccessful pro proposals for the, uh, for the additive manufacturing. But we, we got uh, state commitments that were roughly 50% of what the federal investment was going to be for these NNMIs. Uh, so, so the state of Massachusetts, the state of Connecticut saw economic value in investing in the creation of this institute. So, so the federal investment, which I think uh, uh, helps support some of the basic things that are more portable across the nation, really unlocked some tremendous investments in the state, as well as the, the, the our industrial cost match was far in excess of the federal, you know, sort of $40 million. So I think there are areas where the state sees value in these, but I do agree that um, some of the more advanced R&D things, I think there's a, there's a stronger role for the federal government to play in that. Um, the other thing is on some of the education front, you know, I think there's there's investments obviously at the state level in the community colleges, uh, and, and so I think that's areas where some of those investments could be targeted to support advanced manufacturing. But again, some of the I think exciting opportunities to innovate in community college level education in a lot of ways have to do with things that are occurring on our campus and other campuses at some of these massively online education efforts. MIT launched a program called MITx. Those are going to establish a pedagogy and a mechanism to deliver education in a much different way, and that's going to benefit the nation. And so I think investments at a federal level and some of those things are also important. One other dimension is on the MIIs. We discussed about embedding digital manufacturing networks. So having common platforms independent of the technology that can then be engaged in the design process throughout that value chain, as well as on supply chain planning and management. And a real call out of small and medium enterprises typically do not have access to this. And then the power of, with the formation of the national network, really embedding that kind of platform within each of them that will then help and facilitate um, skilling up the nation. Back, Andrew. Andrew Reamer, George Washington University. Um, 
for 150 years or so, the U.S. government had an explicit policy of, of promoting manufacturing from the 1790s to the 1930s. It was really was a tenet of the federal government that a strong manufacturing sector was globally competitive and was necessary for the U.S. to sustain economic prosperity. And the toolkit grew over time. It was uh, initially tariffs, then it was uh, government invested a lot in R&D, so we, we got a machine tool industry. Um, work with the U.S. Army and interchange of the parts and the rest of the world didn't have that. Um, we had a, a collaboration in, in the latter part of the 19th century, the early part of the 20th century between the federal government and, and the manufacturing sector. Um, the federal government set up the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. The federal government created Radio Corporation of America. Um, so it, the, the precursor to NIST, the International Bureau of Standards, had something I put up like NMP in the 1920s. The work with mature um, So the question is, this was, this was explicit. Republicans and Democrats believed in this. And then we've had a period of 50 years where that's not been the case since the Second World War. So the question is why? Why do you think it's so difficult now, after over centuries, uh, effort in promoting a form of industrial policy that um, it's difficult to catch on. And, and I'll add a second question. Um, terrific report from OSTP. Um, uh, what's the implementation plan? I recognize that I have the, uh, the added manufacturing. The, the, there's some things moving forward, but is there is there a coherent or Implementation strategy. I'll talk to that. So let me take a recommendation because I have my own theory, um, which we talk about in our book, which is on sale now and on Amazon. Low price of nineteen dollars and fifty cents. No, it's true. I think if you look, if you go back in history, you you will look at a nineteen seventy nine article by Larry Summers, and will say this was the turning point. Um, it was all downhill after that. Um, in all seriousness, Larry Summers wrote an article in 1979 for the National Bureau of Economic Research with Alan Auerbach, a leading economist. And uh, in the article, it was a study where he, he analyzed the impact of an investment tax credit on the U.S. economy. And uh, he basically, they ran a very complicated, large, it was called DRI, an econometric model, of what would the economy look like after five years with an investment tax credit, and what would an economy look like without it? With an investment tax credit, uh, capital investment in machinery and equipment went up, as you would expect, and GDP went up. Without it, capital investment went down, and GDP went down. It was small. And therefore, we all know that they logically concluded that we should get rid of the investment tax credit, which is exactly what they concluded. Even though the investment tax credit, according to their economic model, led to a bigger economy. So why did they do that? Because in their view, that was distorting the natural allocation of market forces. Even though it wasn't an investment tax credit for you know, a very narrow, specific technology uh, at that. You know, it was just a broad investment tax credit for the entire world. And that really was the beginning of a very radical shift in economic thinking in the United States that said, uh, essentially, computer chips, potato chips, what's the difference? Now, when you have the president's own uh, head of CEA, um, Christina Romer, after she left the White House, write an op-ed in the New York Times criticizing the administration for singling out manufacturing as an important sector. By the way, it's not the only sector that they, they single out there. Looking at other important sectors like telecom, healthcare, and technology, you know, but they have a focus. And Christina Rover basically said, this is a mistake. All sectors are the same. A dollar of car production is the same as a dollar of first rental car. It's all a dollar. And that is a very, very deeply held view by most economists today. It's a deeply distorted and mistaken view. Uh, and we're the only country in the world with economists who think that way. I mean, every other country realizes that if your companies and industries that are out competing in the world lose that competition, you will have a very poor economy. So, Andrew, I think that's a big factor there. That, that intellectual argument 
really uh, went unanswered for a long, long time, and it led policy <coughs> into this view that all sectors are the same. Now, quick point. It's a very, you know, there, there's, a, there's sort of, you can go down that path too far. We could have a policy that says, Dow Chemical is our national chemical champion, uh, and we're going to give all our money to Dow. Now, Teresa might like that, um, but obviously that would be bad policy. You, know, you shouldn't pick individual companies. You shouldn't take very narrow technologies. But generally, to say things like robotics are going to be important for our future, we're not going to pick a particular robotics firm. Or we don't even know enough to say which robotics technology, but we do know that whatever the 17 or number um, technology, there are core technologies we have to be good at. That's very, very different than the kind of things uh, some of the economists So that's a long answer. Bill, if you want to jump on that. My name is Bill Singer, and I'm uh, the Associate Director. Bill, can you see the answer if you can do it? Bill Singer, I'm the Associate Director of Innovation and Industry Services at NIST. Uh, and so, Andy, in response to your question about implementation, um, over the last almost year, the administration has been tracking these efforts, of course. Although the AMP report is an independent industry university, university report, and has set up a couple of a number of structural mechanisms to carry forward, to analyze and carry forward the uh, recommendations of this report and other reports that uh, private sector groups put out. There. And I believe in December of last year, the administration set up an office of manufacturing. Policy, co-chaired by the director of the National Economic Council and the Secretary of Commerce. Uh, within Commerce, uh, NIST was designated to lead a national program office in advanced manufacturing, similar to uh, what other agencies have done over the years to advance uh, government-wide uh, initiatives, such as uh, uh, NSF's uh, National Coordination Office for NATO. The National Program Office for Advanced Manufacturing is an interagency process led by NIST with active participation by DOD, DOE, NASA, the National Science Foundation, and other agencies such as DOL and the Department of Education. Programmatically, there have been a number of initiatives that have been launched which parallel the recommendations and reflect the recommendations of the uh, steering committee report. One is the uh, Additive Manufacturing Pilot Program that was mentioned earlier. The president announced a, a, a national uh, network of manufacturing institutes of $1 billion proposal in the fiscal 13 budget. And there's been a very active uh, outreach process to uh, solicit views to design that program through a series of regional meetings. Uh, there's one next Thursday at the University of California, Irvine, and one on October 18th at the Colorado University. Uh, the, uh, AMP Steer, the uh, National Program Office, has been reviewing the recommendations of the AMP Steering Committee and identifying a federal government response with lead, a lead agencies that uh, can appropriately uh, take cognizance of those particular actions. And finally, there have been a number of small programmatic initiatives of uh, the Advanced Manufacturing Jobs and Innovation Accelerator, led by the uh, Economic Development Administration, is also a multi-agency, uh, $26 million program to uh, fund regional efforts to advance manufacturing. Uh, those awards will be announced before the before the end of this year. And finally, in relationship to the question about the states, uh, MEP, again, along with the uh, Development Administration, uh, has funded the National Governors Association to uh, assist states with the, the development of strategic plans in advanced manufacturing. So there's been a number of both structural, uh, programmatic, current programmatic, and prospective initiatives. And for our appropriate team from the hall, uh, all of these have been done with existing, within existing authorities and within existing funds. Any, anything you're aware of around the STEM education um, dimension? In terms of implementation. Roger may want to say something about the, uh, the prevention work that you I just spoke about what Tom um, Yeah, I think right right now we've been working with uh, with the Manufacturing Institute. Uh, they've had some foundation funding uh, to be able to uh, develop that uh, and promote that uh, nationwide. Certainly, it is something that we're building into uh, an approach we call Smart Talent, 
which is, again, the strategic approach of, of for manufacturers to deal with that, to build the credentialing in, into that effort. So I think it's something uh, we also are working with community colleges specifically to be able to make sure those connections between the manufacturers and the kind of skills and training that they need uh, are being provided by the community colleges. So it's, it is a, a grassroots kind of from the bottom up, um, making those connections here. Great, other, great time for one or two more questions. Uh, and then here, back friend. Um, my question is for Mr. Clark, and he said something when he was talking about the skilled workforce, and uh, that, that the uh, people have to upgrade their skills, and the companies are less interested in spending their money on upgrading the skills of workers. They're out of that game. I think he said something like that. That's a big uh, change. The company needs to spend money upskilling their workforce. Is that because the companies think they can import the people rather than train their own in this country? Or what, what, what has driven that change? Because that's a dramatic change. So I, I probably exaggerated uh, in that particular sentence. I think that there's less investment, though, than there has been. I wouldn't say that all companies are moving out of it. It depends a lot on what business they're in, how big they are. But I think it has to do in part with um, uh, the uh, uh, alternative uh, locations that they can go to, and partly uh, to do with mobility of workers. Uh, I mean, there are other folks in the room who have much more expertise on this than me, but that's my that's my sense. So it's a combination of changes in the economy and also changes in strategy that have contributed to that. And I think what we're seeing is more of the burden falling on, on workers and on communities. Um, and I don't know that there's anything that can be done to reverse that entirely, but we need some uh, we need some strategy to, to handle that change in the water. So I I disagree. <laughs> and in the context of, I think there is a big difference of different companies. I think you had called out the difference between small and uh, medium companies and the larger companies. I would say we're training more today than we have ever in the past in order to ensure the skilled labor force. You're a small company. Yeah, <laughs> Dow Chemicals. So I'm just okay. saying, and I want to for, for, there's a distinction here to some of the earlier points made by Roger between large and small and medium-sized enterprises. So large corporations, for us to maintain and grow in the U.S., we have to own the training and development, and we have to do it in concert with our labor teams and do it in a most effective way. It's why the power and importance of the stackable skill certification um, so that people can get skilled up with, whether it's in the welding sector or computer control systems, and that they're working on and developing skills that matter. So the partnership with the community colleges, where we're developing the course curriculum, we're providing the equipment to do the body of work. But there's a skills gap of just getting people to be able to do the basic mathematics and reading in order to feed them into this highly trained skills um, workforce. So I think we have a full spectrum across the US and the companies that are very committed for growth, and particularly in the advanced manufacturing sector, are heavily engaged in training of the workforce today. If, if I could just add, um, yeah, I think that may be, I'm sure that's true for certain companies. Um, it sounds like it's true for Dow. But at least the data that we've looked at, both in the report and in the book from uh, ASTD, American Society for Training Health, which is largely surveying large companies, they don't survey small companies. Uh, according to their data, U.S. companies invest about half today in training that they did a decade ago as a share of GDP. Uh, and, and I think that to me is, that, that's, that seems right. That's intu intuitive, at least, matches what I think reality is, uh, which is nice. And I think it's exactly for the two factors that David said. One is that they can uh, get talent elsewhere. Uh, because a lot of other countries are having public-private partnership and or tax policy, including tax policy. And the second is that worker tenure in the U.S. has fallen by probably 35 to 40 percent over the last decade. Uh, it used to be when you invested in a worker, you could count on a number of years before you, you, you could amateurize your investments, like when you buy a machine tool. Imagine buying a machine tool and being told that after three years you have to throw it away. Companies wouldn't buy any machine tools, no different than training. Uh, which is why we argue that you, you need a more, you 
can't just rely on these on, on, on firms who do that because there's a huge externality for firms. And just exactly the same reason they don't optimize their investments in R&D because there's spillovers. There are big spillovers from training. A lot of companies just look to hire workers that other companies have already trained, and everybody thinks about that. Nobody's contributing the common pool. Now, it's not to say that some companies aren't, but certainly are. But I think I think we can't just rely on that. We've got to, we've got to do more. Can I add one? I'd like to add one other thing into this discussion, which is, you know, we, some of my best friends are MIT economists, and, uh, you know, as, as we talk about this skills gap issue. Uh, so good with the MIT. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, we like um, You know, we have some vigorous debates about this point, but I think there's an interesting fact to it, which is that the average length uh, that a, a, a person is in a German apprenticeship system to be trained to work in advanced manufacturing sector. The average duration of that apprenticeship is 40 months, four zero months of training. So when you're setting up a factory or you're ordering a part, you can't wait 40 months to train that person. You put that out, that economic activity in Germany. And, and I think that's one of our challenges. And you know, it, it was embodied in a discussion uh, President Obama had with Steve Jobs when asked why were they assembling iPhones in China? That's where the engineers were that knew how to do that assembly. And so that, that's one of the structural problems we have. Is sort of is, is bringing up that workforce so that they're ready to 